The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, fired for praying. No one should ever have to choose between living their faith and their job. But he won't be silenced. I got blood in that game. The football coach who got canned for his faith shares his side of the story. It was never a forced thing. It wasn't even an ass thing. Then, six miles high and falling fast. Meet the pilot flying on just a wing and a prayer and nerves of steel. Captain Tammy Jo Schultz, nail-biting story on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Raging wildfires in Northern California have exploded, doubling in size. And now new wildfires are torching Southern California, forcing terrified residents to flee in the middle of the night. With no rain in sight and more wind in the forecast, how will it ever end? Mark Martin has the frightening details from California. Hundreds of fires are erupting throughout California. High winds and dry conditions fueling the flames that are threatening Los Angeles neighborhoods in the south and consuming tens of thousands of acres in the north. Just in the last 24 hours, uh, CAL FIRES PUT OUT 330 FIRES IN THE STATE. IN SOUTHERN CALIFORNIA, THE LOS ANGELES FIRE DEPARTMENT SAYS AROUND 10,000 RESIDENTIAL AND COMMERCIAL STRUCTURES WERE UNDER MANDATORY EVACUATIONS, INCLUDING HOMES OWNED BY LOS ANGELES LAKER LEBRON JAMES, FORMER GOVERNOR ARNOLD SCHWARZENEGGER, AND WALT DISNEY CEO BOB IGER. In Brentwood, sleeping residents had to escape their homes in the middle of the night. It was a neighbor who rang the doorbell and said, we've got to evacuate, we've got to get out right this minute. For a time, the flames forced the shutdown of southbound lanes of the Interstate 405. Meanwhile, in the north, the Sonoma County fire has exploded in size, doubling to more than 105 square miles in just 24 hours. More than 100,000 are under mandatory evacuations and at least 96 buildings have been destroyed. Officials say power lines may have caused two fires in the Bay Area, even though there have been widespread power shutoffs to keep that from happening. More than 600,000 people are set to lose power in dozens of California counties. That's on top of the more than 2 million people who are without power over the weekend in the north. The Bethel Global Response Team from Bethel Church in Redding, California, has a team on the ground in Sonoma County. Right now we're partnering uh, with Salvation Army and Red Cross. Um, the focus right now is housing and feeding uh, the displaced. As you, as you guys just mentioned, over 200,000 displaced. Firefighters will have an opportunity to make progress against the fires today as those high winds die down. Unfortunately, they're expected to pick up again today and tomorrow. Mark Martin, CBN News. Tragedy of, of epic proportions. And what I was saying uh, yesterday, is this going to be the, quote, new normal for California? This kind of wildfire has never happened, I, I don't think, in, in, in our uh, recollection. And the fact that Southern California, which has not experienced any of these terrible fires, is, is breaking through. And with these winds, those sparks fly and the tinder, it just takes off. It's awful. Well, in other news, after weeks of pressure, Democrats now say the House will hold a preliminary vote on impeachment to try to determine the, whether some uh, Republicans will have a chance to question witnesses. It's like putting lipstick on a pig. Ephraim Graham has more. At House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced the House will vote Thursday on a resolution laying out the next steps in the impeachment process, including a procedure for holding public hearings. Republicans strongly criticized the Democrats' House, House impeachment inquiry for questioning witnesses behind closed doors. Last week, Senator Lindsey Graham introduced a Senate resolution condemning the process and calling it unfair to the president. 50 Senate Republicans co-sponsored that resolution. In a statement, Graham said the vote is, quote, a bit like unringing a bell. On Fox and Friends, GOP Congressman Jim Jordan said, it's nothing but politics. This is all a, a ridiculous, unfair and partisan process, but the, and the American people see through it. So I think the speaker's gonna try to dress it up a little bit, put a little lipstick on the pig, as they say, and have this vote on Thursday, but it's not gonna change anything. And I think you're gonna see every single Republican vote against it. 
Today, a White House national security official is expected to tell the committee he twice reported his concerns about the administration's Ukraine policy to his superiors. Pat. Ladies and gentlemen, it is so patently obvious when this thing reaches the Senate, which it will be, the, there is no way that 20 Republicans are going to vote against the sitting president in an election year. They just aren't going to do it. It would be, self, it would be suicide, and they don't even consider it. So why would the House Democrats consider an impeachment vote? And as I said yesterday, I say it again, if they do so, they will have to face the voters with a handful of nothing instead of action on foreign policy, action on uh, debt, action on uh, infrastructure, and all these other things they should be doing. And instead of that, this is a uh, illusion. The, there's no way an impeachment process will succeed in the Senate. And so to take a vote on that is crazy. And I said yesterday, I say it again, I don't believe there will be an impeachment vote. What's being talked about now is nothing but procedural. Well, we'll allow you now to come in and, and uh, uh, a, a question witnesses. And Adam Schiff won't be allowed to put you in, in, in a limbo where you can't hear what the witnesses are saying. But that, that's way too late and it's too little. And the Republicans under the Constitution deserve a whole lot more than this. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't boycott it. They should. Or else uh, it's somehow, I don't know how you, you do it procedurally, but something needs to be done. But this whole thing is an outrage. And as I said before, I'll say it again, there is not going to be an impeachment vote in the House that really puts everybody on record. They will not face the electorate with that in their, on their record. And the, the Republicans will have a field day with television spots if they do. And these people are, do not want to give up their jobs, and there will be dozens of them taken out of office if they do. So all this is just smoke and mirrors. It, it gets some television, and I would be amazed at the television uh, entities and the, the media entities that, that are suckered in on this thing because it is just nonsense. Ephraim. Pat, U.S. forces took out another high-ranking ISIS leader in Syria. Abu al-Hassan al-Muhajir was a spokesman for the Islamic State and a potential successor to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the ISIS leader killed in a strike over the weekend. Officials say they learned of Baghdadi's location after capturing one of his wives and a courier. The compound was reduced to rubble by bombs and missiles as U.S. forces and canines pursued him down a dead-end tunnel. The terrorist detonated a suicide vest, killing himself and three of his children. Baghdadi is responsible for thousands of deaths, including Kayla Mueller, an American Christian aid worker who repeatedly was raped. Military officials named the operation in her honor. Those men and women that put their lives on the line, we owe them our sincere thanks. No U.S. military lives were lost in the mission. The administration has released an image of a canine injured pursuing Baghdadi. He is recovering and is back on duty. We turn now to the situation in northeastern Syria. While many believe the fighting has stopped, people on the ground are telling a different story. Chris Mitchell now reports. On the front lines, a small Christian relief group is reporting the ceasefire is in name only. We were hit pretty hard today. There was Turkish armor, and, or Turkish painted armor, three armored vehicles, multiple infantry, m many wounded. We got in the back here. The team is treating them. Lord, help make it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dave Eubank and his free Burma Rangers have been rescuing the wounded and helping those caught up in the fighting. That mortar just hit right here. He says the Turkish army, along with its jihadist allies, are continuing the attack. Right now, the only safe zone that there is is the international border between Turkey and Syria. The other zone is a genocide zone. Christians and Kurds are gone. They can't stay. They will die. There is no ceasefire. Dalton Thomas told CBN's Ben Kennedy on Faith Nation there's two safe zones inside Syria. One for ethnic and religious minorities, protected by the Kurds, and one for ISIS, protected by Turkey. 
And the, the one safe zone was exposed yesterday with Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi being killed, and now we're seeing how far this conspiracy is actually going to go. Al-Baghdadi's safe house sat in a Turkish protected area. Thomas and a number of others suspect Turkey shielded him. Israel's UN ambassador said Turkey's President Erdogan supported terror organizations and wants a new Muslim empire. Erdogan is dragging Turkey down a dangerous neo-Ottoman imperialist path. After Baghdadi's death, Thomas sees a greater threat. Because we're seeing the rise of the true Islamic State, which is the state of Turkey. In the midst of the crisis, Eubank and Thomas are praying for the U.S. and the international community. But I'm praying that our country changes. And not only is guarding oil fields, which are important, but even more important are people. That's why you have oil, for people. And it's their oil. So we need to bring our troops back and draw a new line. My prayer would be that the international community would wake up to what's actually happening and engage to stop it because we're running out of time. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. So, Pat, where do we go from here? Well, I think we go to recognizing who Erdogan is, that he is a thug. And the idea that there's a safe zone for ISIS fighters, it's a miracle that the president was able to get through to get al Baghdadi. And uh, these are a bunch of butchers, what they have done. But to think that Turkey really is the one that wants to make the caliphate, it's going to be Turkey. And if you look at the Bible, it's interesting. You know, the churches of Asia that were written about in the book of Revelation, every one of them are in modern-day Tur Turkey. And Turkey was the home of uh, the most flourishing of the early Christian uh, churches. And now uh, Erdogan wants to make it a Muslim caliphate. Much more uh, problem, um, much larger than ISIS ever thought about being. And uh, the one thing we can't do is enable Erdogan to continue this uh, vendetta against Christians, against Yazidis, against the Kurds, to wipe them out. And there's, uh, to make a safe home for ISIS fighters, it's shocking to think that it's being done, but we need to open our eyes and recognize the threat that's still there. And, uh, you know, we just are delighted at that uh, attack on our body, Bugatti, and um, that ISIS could be uh, in some fashion destroyed because they were vicious killers. Imagine uh, putting somebody in a cage from Jordan, I believe it was, and then throwing gasoline on him and setting him on fire where he couldn't get out. This is the kind of uh, atrocity that this man was uh, involved in. It was beyond horrendous. It is absolutely barbaric. And um, so th thank God that he's been uh, taken out. But there's more to come and more that should be there. But the real threat is still Turkey, ladies and gentlemen. Ephraim. Pat, here at home, a deadly mosquito-borne virus has claimed the lives of at least 13 people. While the latest victim died in Alabama, it is hardest hit in north northern states. Our Caitlin Burke brings us the story from Connecticut, where experts say people are still at risk. Fall in the Northeast is one of the most beautiful times of the year. The leaves are changing and temperatures haven't quite plummeted just yet. But this year, officials from Massachusetts to Michigan are warning entire communities to stay indoors. That's because for the first time in more than a decade, a mosquito transmitted virus called Triple E is killing people. So Triple E virus is a mosquito-borne virus that occurs in the eastern half of the United States. And it's a uh, very rare disease. That's because the specific mosquito that carries Triple E prefers to feed on birds. Connecticut mosquito expert Philip Armstrong became concerned early in the season when his department noticed an unusually high number of this species. We didn't have any evidence of Triple E virus until later in the season, but we knew that the conditions were right. If the virus was brought in by a migratory bird, then it could spread like wildfire. And sure enough, that's what happened. The body's immune system can usually kill the infection, but about one in 20 cases develop the brain infection encephalitis. Once that happens, the odds of survival are slim. Typically on a, any given year, we average about seven human cases nationwide. Um, but uh, it's a very severe disease and serious illness. Uh, it kills about a third 
of uh, those that develop the disease and of those that survive, many of them suffer from lifelong uh, neurological damage. In Connecticut, three of the four confirmed cases with Triple E have died. It starts off with a high fever, maybe a stiff neck, but then it will progress to confusion, uh, seizures, and even coma and, and death. Given the widespread severity, extra precautions are underway from New England to Michigan. While mosquito activity is finally winding down for the season, this year's outbreak won't be eliminated until the first hard frost. Until then, people in affected regions need to avoid mosquito bites. That could mean doing simple measures like covering up, wearing long sleeve pants and shirts and socks and shoes when you're outdoors, uh, particularly in the evening hours when they're most active and consider wearing a repellent to any exposed skin surfaces as well. And that will do a long way to protecting you and your family. Scientists at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Center have actually found that the Triple E virus can survive the winter, even though mosquitoes don't. That means that next summer we could be faced with another Triple E outbreak. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, New Haven, Connecticut. One reason to welcome the freeze, at least in the short term, Pat. I'm looking forward to it. I think the sooner the better. Uh, we, we need a hard frost, but we're not even close to it. It's so benign down here, but so far we haven't had any great outbreak of uh, it's eastern equine encephalitis is what the triple E means, equine, eastern equine, and brought in by migratory birds who the mosquitoes feed upon. Mm -hmm. Well, Sounds we've like got the story know. coming up about a wonderful heroine one of the most amazing stories of this woman who saved a passenger airline. It is incredible. Terror at 32,000 feet. The engine explodes, a passenger is partially sucked out of the window, and a pilot has seconds to figure out how to save everyone on board. So what did she do? The harrowing details are coming up, but first, Fired for praying at the 50-yard line. This coach was canned for giving thanks after every game. Now he's moving his fight from the sidelines to the Supreme Court. But does he have a case? Find out after this. Ladies and gentlemen, we have had a weird uh, interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution says very clearly, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And that has been now morphed into a prohibition against state action. But every state, every state in the United States has in its constitution an acknowledgement of God. Every single one talks about the Almighty under the protection of providence and so forth. We, uh, in the Declaration of Independence, we believe that all men are endowed by their Creator with inalienable rights. There's a famous Supreme Court case, Zorak versus Clausen, where a Supreme Court judge wrote, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose the existence of a supreme being. And suddenly now uh, a school board has taken the temerity to strip a coach of his freedom to thank God for uh, the safety of his players at the end of a football game. And I'm glad that this former uh, uh, well, I don't know if he's a, he's a veteran. He's, he's a combat uh, veteran. But he's standing up. Joe Kennedy and uh, this former Marine. He's a Marine. He's not just a, a, a veteran. He's a Marine. He's not taking it lying down. He's going to fight back. And I hope that the Supreme Court, if it comes into this, will say, you know, he's absolutely within his rights to kneel in prayer. The, you know, all across America, we see this. The, the guys that they get through a game, they hold hands and they kneel down, they thank God and so forth. Why not? Well, he told CBN's John Jessup he'll keep fighting for religious freedom, saying, quote, I've got blood in the game. About an hour-long ferry ride from downtown Seattle and across the Puget Sound sits the city of Bremerton. 
And this is Bremerton High School, as you can see, known as an Achievement Award winner among Washington State Public Schools. It is also known as being home to a legal battle involving a high school football coach and prayer that's gone all the way to the Supreme Court. We had one successful year the whole time I was here, and we won the championship. Joe Kennedy loves the team he coached on this field for years, still proudly sporting the school colors. Everything, even down to my t-shirt, is, is Bremerton Knights. In 2015, that pride turned to disappointment when the school district suspended him for a different public display, prayer. At the beginning, it was kind of awkward to me because I was just giving thanks and I had a couple of kids and they came up and said, hey coach, what are you doing out there? And I was like, just giving thanks for what you guys did. These silent post-game prayers on the 50-yard line caught on, spilling over to his players and even opposing teams. School officials worried, though, this might give the impression that the district approved of the coach's public prayers, creating a potential endorsement of religion. They eventually fired Coach Kennedy. He calls that decision a violation of his free speech. No one should ever have to choose between living their faith and their job. His attorneys at First Liberty Institute argue this case is about the First Amendment and religious liberty. Coaches, teachers, students do not shed their constitutional rights just by walking onto a football field at a public school. Coach Kennedy's stance has sparked passion with big name supporters weighing in and critics who say He's just plain wrong. I talked about the challenges of being a Christian in a place like Seattle. Dory Monson is a popular right-leaning Seattle radio host who's addressed the case on his show. To be a successful coach, you have to bring a diverse group of kids together. I think once a coach starts imposing his faith in a public school, then I think you have challenge bringing those kids together. For him, this hits close to home. As a Christian and former coach, he quietly prayed for his players during games. He cites concerns about the country's religious diversity in disagreeing with Coach Kennedy's approach. If my kids were playing on a sports team and that coach happened to be Muslim, I wouldn't want that coach praying with my kids. And so I felt like as a Christian, it was not my responsibility to pray with the girls that I was coaching at the public high school. Kennedy emphasizes his prayers were never mandatory. I had some parents that I don't want my kid involved in that, and I respected that. That is their right as a parent, and it was never a forced thing. It wasn't even an ass thing. Early this year, the Supreme Court declined to consider the case. Four justices, however, expressed potential interest if the case explored whether the school's demand for Coach Kennedy to stop praying violated his right to practice his religious beliefs based on the First Amendment's free exercise clause. We consider that in a little opinion on our roadmap to victory in Coach's case, and so we're going to follow that now. For now, the case is back in district court, and Coach Kennedy's return to the football stadium to support the team, but from a different point of view. So now when you do the football games, are you up here yep. in bleachers? Matter of fact, I sat right there Friday night. I'm so thankful for being able to come here and then we still got a team and I, I still see these young guys out here and seeing them out there praying still out, out on the 50. So that's kind of cool. That legacy lives on. Yeah. While he misses the kids, he says he's no longer bitter about losing his job. I was blessed for, you know, eight years with these guys and it was just awesome. and. I, I look at my blessings instead of what I lost. Still, as a Desert Storm Marine veteran, Kennedy says the fight is bigger than him. Praying, I could do anywhere. The Christian side of me is like, yeah, well, you don't take away my faith. Prayer makes no difference where you do it. But the Marine in me, I was like, yeah, I will fight for the Constitution and everybody's rights. It means something to me. I, I, I got blood in that game. The Bremerton School District declined our request for an interview citing the ongoing case. The attorney representing the school district also declined our interview. John Jessup, CBN News, reporting in Bremerton, Washington. A few years ago, an organization that I had founded called the National Legal Foundation took on a case before the Supreme Court, and it was argued by Jay Sekulow. It was called Mergens versus Westside School District, and it had to do with whether children could pray in schools, and it was a I believe seven to two victory or eight to one. It was an overwhelming uh, decision by one of the so-called liberal judges that absolutely school children had the right to pray and could not be prohibited from 
praying in the schools. And when somebody tries to stop a sports team from praying, uh, they are going against a, a clear, overwhelming decision of the United States Supreme Court. So I, I hope Coach Kennedy will take this appeal to the, uh, the Supreme Court and he will win. Uh, there's no reason in the world that somebody shouldn't pray. You know, I've prayed with pro teams. I remember uh, I was speaking to one of the, I think, the Miami Dolphins, and I was praying with them before they went onto the field asking for safety. I mean, th this is it's done all the time. You know, when I was playing football in prep school, we always prayed before games. I mean, you, you want God's blessing so you don't get yourself beat up. I mean, it's a standard thing. <laughs> of course you want prayer. <laughs> and to say that you can't pray, I mean, nobody's making those kids pray. If they don't want to pray, that's their business. But nevertheless, uh, you know, anyhow, I hope the coach and I noticed those. Uh, he was a gunny sergeant. He, he, he just wasn't uh, uh, a Marine. He was a gunny sergeant. That means he's a tough guy. And he's in there hanging him, and we're hanging in there with him. All right, we've got uh, a pilot that's got nerves of steel. It's an amazing story. It really is. In fact, that's the name of her book. This pilot couldn't see, couldn't breathe, and had piercing pain in her ears. How on earth did she find a way to land her crippled plane? And then later, stay tuned for your questions. We've got some honest answers. Bonnie says, my new pastor allows church members to eat and drink during the service. Is this disrespectful to God? Pat tackles the issues that matter to you, so don't go away. Well, it felt like a Mack truck hit the side of the aircraft. That's how Captain Tammy Jo Schultz described the scene when her plane's engine suddenly went up in flames. At that moment, the lives of more than 140 passengers were in the hands of a pilot who'd been told she'd never be able to fly. On April 17th, 2018, 20 minutes after Southwest Airlines Flight 1380 took off, Captain Tammy Jo Schultz experienced a catastrophic engine failure, which caused an explosion that severely crippled the aircraft. The rapid depressurization made it difficult to see, hear, and breathe at times. But Tammy Jo and her crew remained calm. She relied on her faith and her years of extensive training as a former Navy aviator to gain control of the Boeing 737. In her memoir, Nerves of Steel, Tammy Jo shares how she followed her dreams earned her wings, and safely landed Southwest Airlines Flight 1380. Please welcome to the 700 Club, the hero of Flight 1380, Tammy Jo Schultz. It's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. If you had to guess, how many times in your life were you told girls don't fly? Oh, a number of times by people who could who could make it happen or not. Yes, but which was really, I think, the part of it that became discouraging after a while. There was a window of time where, even though that had been your dream, you kind of set that aside based on all of the negatives you'd heard. What happened that changed and brought you back into path with your original dream? Well, part of it was just seeing a woman getting her wings in, the, in a, a class there at Vance Air Force Base. And I realized, okay, they said that <laughs> girls don't fly, but I'm, I'm seeing it. So after talking to her and realizing, okay, there is a way under the fence and I'm gonna find it. Even in your attempts to go into the military and to become a pilot, you were told all along the way that that wasn't possible. You finally go into the Navy to do this. Did you, did you have a lot of discrimination along the way? Tell me about what happened. Well, I think when, I mean, I was the only female in my squadron for the first three squadrons in two years. So, of course, if you're a green apple in a bushel of red, you can sometimes garner yeah. more attention than you would like. And um, I served with some incredible men, prince among men, uh, and great aviators. But, of course, every once in a while there would be yeah. someone who thought that... Um, they didn't want to be challenged by a girl doing the same thing they were doing and made life a little tough. The, the hard part about that in reading your book, I, I felt so frustrated for you, was you could have 
spoken up about those things, but you would have had to live with even greater repercussion mm -hmm. after the fact. So you just kind of decided to tough it out. That had to be difficult and miserable. Well, you know, I mean, the things we learn at home sometimes serve us well throughout life. Isn't and that the one truth? of the things that, that my parents, especially my mom said was, tell God on them. I mean, get on your knees and just tattle. <laughs> and then when you finish, pray for them. Yeah. And, and then review what, are you, are you meeting resistance because it's not a wise thing to do? Or, you know, what's your motive and yeah. what's your merit? Mm -hmm. And so I would compare my motive to theirs and feel like mine was more noble. Exactly. And, <laughs> and, um, and just let the Lord handle that and move on. Yeah. Study harder move on. Be better. Exactly. Yeah. And God often uses those hard things in our lives to hone us. And oh, I think so. To prepare us. It made you do more, go farther, be better. So let's go back to last April and what actually happened in that Southwest flight that you were commandeering. Let's yeah. talk about you had 140 some people on board. Yes, 149. And just about the time as you took off that most pilots are kind of you know, loosening the tie a little bit and sitting back and saying, we made it, we're up, we're at, you were at 32,000 some feet in right. the air. What happened? Well, Darren and Ellis are my first officer, and I both thought we'd been hit by another aircraft that we'd had wow. in a midair because the jolt was so violent. And the aircraft went into a snap roll to the left, and we both caught it and leveled the wings. And, and then just as quickly, uh, there was suddenly such a shuddering of the aircraft and a roar through the aircraft that we couldn't focus our eyes on anything. We couldn't hear each other and then we couldn't breathe. And so uh, that was the beginning. <laughs> so how did you gather your wits about you, Tammy Jo, to figure out what to do next? Smoke filled the cabin at one point. I mean, you right. can't even see the instruments, much to, less decide what you're going to do. You right. can't speak, as you said, to the co-pilot. So how did you communicate with the, each other and how did you decide what to do next? Well, it, it, being isolated like that, adrenaline kicks in. And I remember thinking, good news, bad news. And the bad news was I didn't think everything would stay on the aircraft for us to get it to the ground. And that kind of led me to the, the mental cliff of what if, which would be, this would be the day that I meet my maker. Wow. And that's when I stopped. The rush stopped and I just had a calm because I realized I wouldn't be meeting a stranger that I meet with him every day. And so uh, that is where I stepped away with a calm in my heart that I think was reflected in my voice, but also in just being able to think through the many decisions that Darren and I needed to make to get to the runway in Philadelphia. They were layers deep and they had to keep changing with the circumstances. Yes. What had actually happened that caused all of this? Well, and we just dealt with the, the symptoms for a while. What we didn't know had happened was the number one engine had exploded and, and then shredded the cowling back Good. so that it stayed attached, kind of like a banana peeling, and it was flailing in 500 mile an hour wind. It had also taken chunks out of the leading edge and damaged a window, which had blown out. And so that caused the roar, that caused the rapid depressurization. There was also just an unscripted combination of emergencies that ensued. Hydraulic lines were cut, fuel lines were cut, and, and so we were dealing with drag that we hadn't ever practiced dealing with. Oh. And, and then getting closer to the ground, we realized we didn't have level off capability, that the thrust from the good engine wasn't uh, all ours to use. How did so. you land this thing? Um, very carefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and truthfully, with, with layers of experience and and training and I've, I've been asked every once in a while if I felt like the Lord landed the plane and I said no he had prepared me for years he'd been pouring <laughs> into me for years to take care of that. What are the three takeaways you want people to get from your book Nerves of Steel? I would say it would be habits, heroes, and hope. Mm -hmm. Habits being 
uh, what we choose as a habit on a you good day. You meet with the Lord every day and you pray before every flight. Uh, probably my most important habit of, <laughs> of life. <laughs> yes. and, and those are instincts mm -hmm. in, in a bad day. And we have that generous gift of choice. Heroes, uh, no title, no equipment required, just taking the time to see and the effort to act on behalf of someone else. Yeah. And last but most important, hope. Um, when we had a plan and a destination and and communicated that, it gave our flight attendants and passengers hope. And uh, you said over the loudspeaker, we're not going down, we're going to Philadelphia. Right, <laughs> right. And, and I think that, you know, having a destination, whether it's in an airplane that's a rough, rough ride, mm -hmm. or in life, yeah. that, that element of a destination doesn't have to change our circumstances. Mm -hmm. It changes us, and that's enough. It's a gripping story. Nerves of Steel is her brand new book. I want to mention also there's a Nerves of Steel coming out for young people. Oh, yes. In September, right? My heart is or, wrapped around that one. When is this one out? Is it's it? the same thing. It's got a few more stories than what the Nerves of Steel does. They're shorter chapters, but it was junior high and a junior book that put my paths on uh, the feet, uh, my feet on the path to aviation. Get it for your school library, folks. Tammy Jo, thank you for being on the program. What an amazing story. Oh, thank you. Bless you. Well, still ahead. One horrific night of monster tornadoes. These deadly twisters caused a tree to crash through one woman's roof and onto her bed. How did she escape just in the nick of time? But first, your chance to hear from Pat. John says, I have three adult children. All of them chose careers and education instead of having families. Is God punishing my wife and me by not giving us grandchildren? I can't help but think God allowed things to work out this way. We've got more of your questions and some more answers coming up. Don't go away. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The Southern Philippines is recovering from a magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake. There are reports of at least one death and dozens of injuries. A 66-year-old man died of head injuries as he ran for cover, with many others attempting to escape the damage of the quake. It happened in the Carabato province. Several schools and businesses are closed for safety inspections before reopening after the tremor. It is the same area where another earthquake hit earlier this month, killing five people. A major development in the case of the Christian pastor, John Cao. Cao is a U.S. resident held captive in a Chinese prison. The American Center for Law and Justice says a U.N. group is calling for his immediate release. The husband and father is currently serving a seven-year sentence for his faith. The ACLJ has a petition drive to free Pastor Cao. It currently has more than 200 thousand signatures. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Anita Ellis was fast asleep until she heard the crash of shattering glass. And in the seconds it took her to get up, a tree came smashing through her roof, landing right on top of her bed. When a series of deadly tornadoes tore through Ohio, Anita Ellis barely escaped with her life. I was sleeping and I heard glass break. That made me get up. And when I came out of the bedroom, the tree fell right over top of my bed where I'd been laying. Part of the ceiling and piles of debris crashed into the spot Anita was lying just moments before. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Lord. I got a picture of the Lord just of his hands. And that was right over my head. It didn't touch that picture. And that made me feel so good. Insurance will take care of the house, but there's a crushed shed and piles of belongings to sort through. Not only is Anita 73, but the years she spent working on a factory assembly line left her with painful injuries. I had to take a medical retirement in 96. I've had two back surgeries, arm surgery, hand surgeries, and I can't do it like I used to do. Thankfully, Operation Blessing volunteers were already at work on her daughter's house right down the street. When they learned about Anita, they were happy to find out how they could help. I seen you guys pull up. I seen those blue shirts and I thought, 
It's like angels flying in. They all gave me hugs. They're God's people. It's like I've known them forever. <laughs> Our volunteers prayed with Anita and lifted her spirits. Then they got right to work. You guys have taken the pieces of the shed down and bagged up all the debris, sorting through my memories <laughs> and boxing up what's not broke. I thank everybody that donates to Operation Blessing. They are a blessing, a big blessing. And Jesus is right beside them. You can see. <laughs> you know what you can see? You can see the hope that has been restored to Anita. You know, all of that happened. All of that was possible because of your kindness and generosity, 700 Club members. We want to say thank you. You are giving to work like this and other amazing things that are happening all around the world. And if you notice, everywhere we go, everything we do, we take the Lord Jesus Christ with us. We want to say thank you. For those of you who aren't 700 Club members, today's a great day to join. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. Just call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. Say you want to join. When you join, we want to send you the transforming word. We think this will be a blessing to you as Pat reads from Proverbs for all of us for wisdom, favor, and anointing. We want you to have this, so call now. Time for some email. Are you ready? All right, let's go for okay. it. Okay. This first one comes from Bonnie, who says, I love the church I'm going to. However, our new pastor allows people to bring food and drink into the sanctuary. It smells like a coffee shop. It really bothers me. Last Sunday, someone spilled something sticky on the floor. I think it's a distraction and disrespectful to God. When I was young, we'd go hours without something to eat or drink during church, and we were fine. What do you think about this? Well, uh, what the apostle Paul said about communion. He says, look, uh, if you got to eat a meal, go, go to your home and eat a meal and, and come to the house of the Lord for communion and recognize that you're dealing with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Um, this whole thing uh, is not so disrespectful. It's just stupid. I mean, you know, who wants to have... Uh, you know, uh, onion smell in church and, and sticky uh, drinks on the seats. I mean, it's just an impractical thing to do. Uh, I mean, you know, for heaven's sakes, you have uh, areas where <clears throat> you can't uh, take food or drink into certain uh, areas because it makes a mess. And I think the church should say, you can't do that. If you want to have a meal, go outside to eat. and well, then Actually, I think the church supplies it in these instances. Well, that's even more foolish. I mean, you know, that, that's, I mean, have a happy time. Have a time after service where the, the people have fellowship and they have food. That's cool. Maybe before have food, but don't take it into the church. It should be forbidden. I mean, it's, it isn't so much disrespectful. It's just stupid. Stupid is different. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is John who says, I have three adult children, twin girls, 40, and a son, 38. None of my children are married, and they have no children of their own because they wanted their education and careers to be first. Is God punishing my wife and me by not giving us grandchildren? I understand that God does not do bad things to his beloved, but maybe he's allowing this. So many people our age have many grandchildren and even great-grandchildren. I'm very distraught over this and would value your opinion. All right. Uh, I don't think God's punishing you because your kids aren't having children. That's, that's uh, ridiculous. But what I will say about those children, one day they're going to get old. And they'll get old a whole lot faster than they think. They're already like 40 going on. And 50, 60, 70 comes before you can bat your eye. And it's so nice to think that you've got children who can help share the burden and look after you in your old age and so forth, and they're going to be alone. And that's what's terrible. I mean, so maybe they're just ill. Who's going to come visit them? Nobody, because the children aren't there. Who's going to bring them food? Nobody. They're on their own. Who's going to help them financially? Nobody. I mean, it's just not wise. And these children need to wake up to the fact that they are mortgaging their own future. They're not, you're not being punished. They're punishing themselves. All right. This, 
this is Darla Pat, who says Revelation chapter 19 talks about what we know about Armageddon, but it talks about the birds being called to a great feast. I can see this happening hundreds of years ago, but I can't see the armies coming to destroy Israel on horses. I can see God destroying the soldiers now with huge stones from heaven, and I see volcanic action maybe doing it. How do you see that happening? And any idea to when it will be with everything that's going on? I pray that you do make it to 100 and that you'll be on TV for us to still have your input into our lives. We trust you to give us the truth. I'll tell you a story. It was kind of cute. I was, you know, Armageddon means Mount of Megiddo. Har Megiddo, mm -hmm. and that's where the so-called last battle, but it's not going to be there. It, the battle is at the Battle of Jerusalem, and the armies will gather at, at Armageddon and go up towards Jerusalem. Okay, I was in Megiddo, and then I took a car, and we drove across the Jezreel Valley, and we were going up into the uh, heights beyond, and uh, I was looking. You know, I would heard all these stories about all these birds gathering for the feast and all this, and I kept saying, where are the birds? <laughs> and finally, there was one bird. I said, is that one of those? She said, no, that's a stork. <laughs> and that was the one. But all the, I read that the people write these tracks. They say the birds are gathering in, in the it's Jezreel. Not, yeah, it's just nonsense, just absolute nonsense. But, you know, what they're doing is, in Revelation is describing uh, in their terms what will happen in later terms. And they, when the, the armies gather against the Lord, there will be hailstones, fire, brimstone, and all that stuff. But uh, there won't be horses. They'll be, they'll be uh, in tanks. Uh, they'll be in modern mo day. Modern day horses. I mean, but you know, just recognize the, what the Bible's talking about. And uh, that in their day, it looked like horses. In our day, it looked like tanks and, and you know, half tracks and all that stuff. Well, Sandra Robinson had a blinding pain in her eye, and her tears only made it worse. Sandra had no health insurance. She couldn't afford to see a doctor. The good news, what Sandra could still do, was turn on, you guessed it, the 700 Club. Watch this. I remember borrowing some mascara from my daughter, and um, she had the type that has fibers. And I, I brushed it on my eye, and I didn't uh, think of it anymore. And a few weeks later, my eye started to close. Author and Philadelphia native Sandra Robinson couldn't afford to let problems with her eyesight slow her down. I kept thinking in my head, you know, what in the world is happening? I, first, I thought it was allergies. And I've never had any allergies in my eyes or any allergies, period. But the eye only got worse. I write a lot, and it, it looked like the words were moving if I would write or read. And I, it, it was blurry, and it, it was just so uncomfortable. I just didn't feel like myself. It really, really made me nervous, you know? And I, it, it seemed like every day it was getting worse. Without health insurance and between jobs, Sandra couldn't afford to see a doctor. And I bought all these products, you know, eye wash and um, artificial tears and all the different things, the lubricant for the eyes, because I thought maybe it was dry and, you know, everything I could think of over the counter. After four long months, the pain had become excruciating. And my eye would not stop running and the pain, it, it it, it seemed like the, the tears made the pain worse, like it was burning. I was like, oh, Lord, please help me, help my eye, you know? It was just really, really painful, and that was the worst. At times, Sandra even had bouts of depression. It was hard. It was hard. You know, when, when, when you're in the process of trusting God, you have to trust Him with all things. And with that trust came healing through the 700 Club. She was watching on her phone. So I was um, about to put a, refresh my face with makeup, and I heard the host say, Somebody has an eye infection. Uh, there's been some material under there. The Lord is going to take it out, and you're going to be, the eye's going to be fine, but that, uh, that the irritating material will be taken away right now, and the Lord is healing you. Just put your hand on your eye in the name of Jesus. So I put my hand on my right eye, and the moment I removed it, it was gone. 
My eye dried up, it wasn't red anymore, it was just done. I didn't have to go to the doctor. The doctor came to me. I was like, hallelujah! I was so grateful because, you know, I couldn't pay for it. And I just believed God was gonna do something and he did it. He used the 700 Club to do it. So after the Lord healed my eye, I, was, I went immediately back to writing and doing all the things that I do daily. Clearly. <laughs> I don't know what God you're talking about if you think God doesn't still heal. Because our God is mighty and he's, he's, he's the same today, tomorrow, and forever. He's still in the healing business. What a testimony. What a wonderful lady. Um, we have some other answers to prayer. There's somebody named Rand from San Diego, California. He's been experiencing balance problems. He got so bad that he went to the emergency room. Then one day, Rand was watching this program, and Terry said, quote, someone has a really unstable walk. You're just going to be able to walk without trouble. Rand said, that's for me. And you know something? The dizziness left, and he can walk un. Uh, hampered. That's on, wonderful. Yes. Well, this is Tammy. She lives in Cibolo, Texas. She suffered great pain in her right knee. She was eventually taken to the ER, told it was torn. She wore a brace and just learned to live with the pain. One day she heard you, Pat, on this program, give a word of knowledge for the healing of, quote, someone who is having a lot of right knee pain. The next day, all of the pain was gone. She hasn't needed the knee brace since then. You know, we sit here and uh, we hear these reports and we're very happy to hear these answers to prayer. And I want you to know, folks, God loves you. And he has a miracle for you if you'll just pray with us. And we'll believe God together. Thank you, Father. I pray right now for these in this audience who are suffering. I pray for those who are hurting. Lord, Little children have been separated from their parents, and even now they're crying out because they're lonely and they don't know where their parents are. And at this moment, I pray that you will comfort them and send an angel to lead them to their parents. They might be reunited in the name of Jesus. Terry, what do you have? As someone else, you have a weird... Um condition in your mouth, like your tongue has developed a covering that's that's kind of rough and hard and you can't taste your food well anymore. It's hampered your speech. God is changing that for you right now. Just receive it and begin to praise him. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, just continue to bless and we thank you for your goodness in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. We leave you with today's power minute from First Thessalonians. Rejoice always. Pray without seeking, with ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Well, that's all the time we've got for this. Uh, tomorrow, we've got the secret Chinese plans to rule the world. How did they deceive the West? Bill Gertz has the shocking revelation. That's on Wednesday, 700 Club. So for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much for being with us. And we will see you at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye. God bless every one of you.